Hey folks, Dave from Nerdarchy, for nerds by nerds, hanging out with this nerd. Nerdarchist Ted. Do you trust your dungeon master? Or are they just out to get you? Jump down in the description below where you can sign up for Nerdarchy the newsletter, get weekly gaming tips, as well as learn how to game with us. All right, so we want to discuss the benefits of trusting your dungeon master in Dungeons and Dragons, and any other role-playing game for that matter as well. Uh, we, you know, you and I have been gaming together for, at this point in time, uh, more than half of my life. Uh, and, you know, for a while, you were one of the first serious DMs that I ever had. Uh, and, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and in those early days, we've, we've talked about this in videos uh, past, that there was a little bit of the antagonistic DM. And there were times it was like, dude, are you out to get us? You know, what's going on? But 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons you know, I, I feel has evolved the game into this cooperative storytelling, or maybe that's just, you know, how it came to be at our table. But, you know, I, I think there's there's much more involved now than there was before. And I think that there's definitely a, a topic here of, you know, if we're friends, if we're doing something on a regular basis, like there needs to be that level of trust that we're here to have fun together. It's not, you know an adversarial relationship. Right, so, you know, speaking to that from, you know, the Dungeon Master's perspective, or for Game Masters out there, they're very much in the earlier um, editions of the game, it's just the earlier evolution of RPGs in general, right? They're very much, a lot of times, was this player versus Game Master mentality, which is kind of weird, you know, and, and when you think about it, because as the game master, you have access to all the rules plus the ones you can make up. It is literally a one-sided uh, contest, <laughs> you know, because you're almost like a god with unlimited power. <laughs> well, I mean, to an extent that, that that's really there. And we've had conversations before about this and saying that, well... I have the entire book of mon of monsters. I can make up whatever I want. So if I wanted to kill you, I can kill you. There is no if ands about it. I've got everything at my disposal. I literally can control everything in the world that isn't one of those, you know, four to six player characters. So oddly enough, in the earlier uh, early days, all right, I feel like the better GMs kind of played that adversarial role still, but at the same time. They had like this unspoken code of honor, <laughs> you know, and each was different depending, and depending who you played with, where, you know, they did set out to be really tough and they would kill your character with, you know, without any hesitation, but they didn't like, they didn't break the rules as they saw them or their rules when it came to that. So they would put things out there and the players would have to deal with it and try and survive. Now, we've had GMs that weren't as good who would totally go over the top and do insane things. And, and we've told stories about that over and over again. Right. A good example was our buddy Steve, who dropped like five different walls on the party. You know, wall of ice, wall of fire, wall of stone. And like, there was no escape. There's nothing you could really do. And, and mind you, half the party was like level three or lower. Yeah. So this happened because, you know, new characters who entered the game, or if you're, if you died, you started lower level than what the current party was. So like, you know, Nate, Dave, and myself, we were level nine, and we had like six or seven other characters that were there that night that were like levels one through four. And it was like, oh, first encounter of the night, you're all in this inn, something rips the roof off of the building, and before you can react, does all of this and roll damage, all right, half of you are dead, all right, now let's get back to the main characters. It's like, like <laughs> Yes. So there was no chance to do anything with that. Now, like an example from one of my games would would have been when like this half fiendish, half draconic Hydra in third edition, you know, steps over the city wall, <laughs> and uh, you know your character told the Thagonar was you know taunting him at the time, so it turned all all of its heads, all twelve heads, <sighs> on your character and was beginning getting ready to breathe. <laughs> So, like, you had some opportunities where you could do some things or react, and the other players had a chance to react. But it looked like a foregone conclusion where your character was just going to be dead. I did the math. And, you know, I'm a nerd. I know what, what the damage is on, on these things, or at least at that moment, I knew how much damage those heads were, gonna, were going to do. And I'm like, average damage is going to take me from where I currently am to dead. Not knocked unconscious, like, 
dead. I'm done. There's nothing I can do here. And it was, you know, uh, formerly known as Nerdarchist Ryan, uh, who was like, well, I can do something. It's going to have very little chance of success, but I really wanted to add this scroll into my spell book. <laughs> And yeah, he cho he made the check to make sure he could be able to uh, read the scroll and cast the spell. And then the monster had to make a really low saving throw. Like, I think I needed a five or a four on the <laughs> die. And whatever it was, I just cockily rolled it into open and I rolled one number under what I needed. <laughs> and it was turned to stone. Uh, saving Ted's character. <laughs> yes, it did. Yeah. Now, you know, that was a really harsh and brutal encounter. But like playing by my my own code of honor and rules was Ted brought it upon himself by antagonizing the monster and making himself the prime target. The, the, this encounter happened so long ago. I don't remember precisely what I did to antagonize this guy. I loved this character. He'd already died once in this uh, campaign in the low levels uh, because of another stupid mistake that I made. Uh, and, and I fully admit that, and we've told that story before as well. Uh, and, and it's just an amazing encounter that happened. And I think we're actually going to going to take that city and have that statue and that thing be part of our current world just because it'd be you know amusing and a nod to our history but you you've you've got this moment where like dms didn't roll out in the open you know you roll behind the dm screen it's one of the reasons why it's there but dave was so sure of himself he was like that cocky dm is like Psh, i got this and he literally just casually tossed the die out and it rolled right through the middle of the battlefield and when it came up as a three like the table roared like it was an, uh, an amazing scene in a movie it was like oh my god saving ted's character's life uh, you know, granted, our style has evolved since then quite a bit. Absolutely. We play differently. and But the problem with being that antagonistic GM is really it's hard for your players to trust you. And, and it's hard to build a good story together. Now, there is other ways where you as the GM can do things to, to kind of like help your players and, and, and gain their trust to tell better stories. And one of the things like we've mentioned time and time again is the screen, right? The DM screen is a tool that can be used. Uh, some GMs have different views on this and dice rolling in general. Uh, some GMs only roll behind the screen. Other GMs will roll in front of the screen. And then there's GMs that kind of do a combination of both. You know, depending on what's going on. Most times I do roll out in front. There are times that, you know, because it's habit, I just, you know, pick up the die and I roll it behind the screen. But, you know, though those mindsets give you the different mentalities. I, as a GM, I want my encounters to be challenging so that the players feel threatened, so that when they win, because most of the time they are going to, they feel that they've overcome something. If you have all-powerful characters who walk through every single encounter, the players will have the tendency to get bored at your table because they don't feel that they've been properly threatened. This is something that, you know, I I fight against all the time. I want to make every encounter, well, maybe not, it doesn't have to be every encounter, but I want to feel that on the whole, the, the combats that they do give that threat level. I want there to be that tension. So there are times that, if you roll behind the screen and that player has that really high armor class, you're just having a crappy night. Well, you've got the ability to turn those, those, uh, those hits or those misses into hits. Or if the dice rolls are going really bad for the players and you're rolling hot, well, maybe you make those hits into misses and keep an, an even keel and, and it brings that, that into balance and everybody has more fun. It still is challenging. It's still a threat, but the players are able to, to win out. And everything can be, can be done in that same vein. You can take that same mentality of dice rolling into the rules. You as the dungeon master, game master in 5th edition D&D, you have the capacity to break the rules for the fun of the game. Uh, Nerdarchy has talked, you know, previously about you know the rule of cool. So when a player comes up with a really cool idea, eh, the rules say you can't do that, but it's your table. You can do what you like, and if that idea is amazing, let it work. Yeah, it's all. It all depends what you need. There's a couple things. There's a couple caveats to that, though. Like if you're breaking the rules to help your players because the encounter was a little tougher than you planned, 
or you know, or or in order to make the counter tougher. One of the things about that is you can never let them know you did it. <laughs> this, you must take this secret to your grave. That you know, otherwise you're gonna break that trust, and they're not gonna they're not gonna think anything they do, do, do does matters. There's other times where you can break the rules, and it's fine that they know it doesn't matter. For instance, in one of my recent games of the sister, um, the Scarlet Sisterhood, there was an instance in the game um, when they needed to go someplace, and they were going to use the teleport spell. Well, the player that that normally casts that spell wasn't there for this session. So for that game night, instead of taking Teleport out of the player's handbook for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, what I did was I allowed that player to cast, or that character to cast the spell and modify it a little bit. They didn't go with the, with the adventuring party when, you know, when they got teleported to, uh, to, to someplace else in order to facilitate us playing D&D that night, you know, without that player being there or having to come up with, you know, other things or me be you know taking that character and using it for an npc which i really don't like i'd rather be either the character is there or they're not and it's all according to whether their their player is there or not so you know that's an instance where yes we broke dungeons and dragons rules and everyone was okay with it because the other players they just wanted to play the game that night that's building the trust with your dm but as as players like we want to find ways to trust the DM and and trust each each other as well, right? Absolutely. One of the huge problems with a group of players in a game like D and D or even other role playing games where there's no trust between player and game master is what's what's going to happen is it's going to bring your game to an ass grinding halt as they're so paranoid about everything that's going on, everything you say. Everything that happens in the game, it stops the game from happening because because they're trying to win, uh, and it might not be their fault because if if the DM has set up this adversarial role where they always feel like they're under the gun or the dungeon master is out to get them, then they're trying to preserve their characters and keep them alive instead of just enjoying the game and, and playing the game. Well, you're going to get into these micromanagement moments. Like, okay, well, I have to make sure that... I've got all the supplies that I need. I need to have my encumbrance figured out. I need to have my my food rations. I need to have, you know, winter gear. I need to have all of this stuff that a lot of DMs that I know, like, oh, yeah, you know that you were going to that hand wave it minus your gold, you've got it, move on. That takes away from the game. Or you get into these dungeon crawls where the the rogue is making checks every 10 feet. Oh, do I find any traps? Investigate, perception, all the time. Let me check, 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 check. Oh, oh, you missed it. Okay, well, now everybody else is going to start grabbing dice and making these rolls. And as opposed to having fun, you're just sitting there rolling dice. And let's face it, I can sit there and I can roll dice on my own and have, you know, have that be whatever it is. It's much more fun to get in and be part of the game as opposed to just rolling dice. Well, you know, that's the other part, too, of, of the players, of the GM being able to trust the players, right? When, no, I'm not going to make you make rolls all the time, you know, or, you know, give me rolls before the game. If you don't want to do any of that, and it's just when it's crucial and when it matters, tell the, the, the that particular player, give me a roll. They either pass or they fail. None of this, okay, now the whole table is going to make rolls because they know the ro the rogue just rolled a two. Right. And that's going to fail. You know, so you know, it's gotta gotta it has to work both ways. And, and that can be one of the problems. I mean, there's ways to circumnavigate that. We've talked about it in many of our other Dungeons and Dragons videos. Uh, you can check the catalog of <laughs> the back catalog of videos for that. Um, but yeah, but you know, that's kind of like the other side of that trust. And you know, when these things mesh together and the players and the dungeon master are just building a story together instead of the players just trying to run the game master's gauntlet to survive, it's so much more fun. It makes the game so much more enjoyable. And if you want it to be enjoyable, I mean, that that's, that's the choice. Like you either have this, you know, adversarial relationship or you have trust and fun. Like, I, it doesn't, it's not easy to, to have both sides. Well, what about, there's certain instances, and I feel like almost <laughs> all GMs can do this. And, you know, especially with like Matt Mercer and Critical Role out there. <laughs> so it's so much more visible. And all the other streams, 
uh, Dungeons and Dragons games that are going on. There are some certain words that the GM is going to is going to say instantly triggers your players to know that something's going on. It's like you know it it, it gets your hackles up of like, oh. Are you sure you want to do that? You know, or you can try. Like, you know, the, the way it just comes across, it doesn't matter how much emphasis you put on that, you know, like those phrases, it's like, all right. <laughs> how far did you reach in that hole in the wall? <laughs> what do you mean, how far? You, you know, and so th there's definitely those kind of things. And even if something bad happens in the game, as the player, you got to trust your dungeon master that it's all going to be okay in the end. And, you know, the worst case scenario is maybe a character dies. But a good dungeon master, that's not their intent. Their intent is to tell the story. But, you know, if there is no uh, risk in the game, then the reward doesn't really mean anything. You know, char character deaths, uh, if you've got an emotional investment in a character, you've been playing them for a long time. Like, yeah, that can be hard. Uh, I, I've been playing, you know, the character in your game for years now, and, like, that's the only long-standing 5th edition D&D &D character that I've got, and there's, like, a long list of things that I want to make, so I'm like, alright, if Relian kicks the bucket, I've got go-tos that I can pull out and just start playing, so, yeah, it'll suck to not see this guy to the end, but there's always more stories that's out there, and, you know, yeah, that's where that dude, you know, met his end, but... So what? I'm still part of the story. You're still part of the story. And, you know, the legend of Relion will live on. Now, and there's a, one last point to make. And that is literally, if you're a player in a Dungeon Masters game, you know, in uh, Dungeons and Dragons or other role-playing games, you literally only have one cho tr uh, choice, and that is to tr trust your Game Master, right? Now, that being said, it's then up to that Game Master or that Dungeon Master to, to kind of like nurture and, and protect that trust and be responsible with it. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it's the GM's job to, to control that. And should he or she fail, well, then you know for the next game, well, maybe I don't want that person to be my dungeon master anymore. Maybe for the next RPG, I want somebody else to step up. Yeah, your styles might not mesh, or or maybe a conversations in order. You guys can, you guys, you guys uh, and gals at the table can talk it out and you know hopefully get on the same page. So, what do you do uh, with, with your game to get your get your game master to trust your players, or you as a player to trust your game master? Let us know down in the comments below. While you're down there, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. On your way down there, check the description where you can find a link to Nerdarchy the store and go grab a copy of Secrets of the Vault. So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.